Okay. We've got a couple of minutes left here, I guess one minute for one o'clock, so uh, welcome. Get my desk organized right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Garrettson uh, from Wood Prairie Farm. Uh, welcome to our second Potato School webinar. I've got Frank, uh, our IT guys, beside me. Uh, so hopefully if there's any um, <coughs> snafus, he can bail us out. Um, I imagine some folks are going to be join, uh, joining us here, so we'll get off to a little bit of a slow start. So, uh, okay. And then remind me again how I get to the second slide. Okay. Thank goodness for IT help. Okay, there we go. I like maps, and here, here's another one that I came across. I believe that this one was uh, produced in 1922, and uh, it's a beautiful map. And it does convey um, what is still true today, that agriculture is widespread across the country. And it's really um, uh, the basis upon what our economy is established. Um, if you would like to use the uh, chat function uh, that you will find at the bottom of the screen, you can type in and uh, we'd be interested in knowing where you are listening from. And uh, as you type that in, uh, other folks that are attending this webinar uh, also, we'll see. So, uh, as we're starting out here, we'd love to hear from Buddy uh, that's on the line. Okay, Beverly and hi, Beverly. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Uh, continuing with introductions. Uh, that's me uh, sitting on that propane flamer tractor. Uh, if you look close, you can see that I'm squinting. Uh, I've since learned that when you're doing that um, job, it's best safety glasses, the force of air and propane coming out from those burners uh, on the front uh, toolbar is such that it uh, makes airborne, um, you know, little tiny uh, pieces of dirt. And, um, if the wind is just right and it it's blowing back towards you, uh, it kind of uh, can blind you a little bit. So I've since learned that uh, having safety glasses on uh, just makes it easy and I don't have to squint as much. But um, that is our technique for top killing potatoes in the fall, um, which is the topic of our, our future um, webinar story. But um, uh, we also use it in the spring um, for potatoes. We use it for pre-emergent uh, weeding or 10% emergence, and um, we also use it on other crops like beets, and uh, particularly well suited to a slow germinating crop like carrots, uh, in that we'll flame uh, a bed of carrots about six days after planting. That will kill any uh, newly germinating weeds, allowing the carrots, when they germinate on day nine or 10, to come up into a clean bed. So it's a very a uh, practical tool um, becoming much more commonly used here in the United States, but it's been used uh, extensively in Europe now for 30 years. Uh, we've had our flamer for about 25 years. So I see we've got uh, Carmen in North Carolina, uh, Jan in Virginia, uh, Suzanne Morse, my friend in Bar Harbor. Uh, uh, how are you doing, Suzanne? And uh, Teresa Martz, uh, I think down in the mid-Atlantic anyway. And uh, Teresa has a great, great uh, anic gardening website, uh, which we mentioned in the um, Seed Peace newsletter that we got out this morning. Uh, it's called Tending My Garden. And uh, Teresa did a great job writing up the description of green sprouting from webinar number one 
last time around. So uh, I recommend uh, you uh, tuning into her blog, and um, uh, if you want some written down notes on the green sprouting that we talked about last webinar, uh, Teresa did, did a good job, and it's available to you. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention uh, this morning, uh, our son Caleb uh, went live with a new uh, crowdfunding project on BarnRaiser, and uh, Frank, I think, is going to type in the URL. Um, we, uh, uh, Megan and I, have now been farming for 40 years, and it's time for us to start to transition the farm to the next generation. So uh, we've been in that process for a while now, and in order to make it smooth and successful, um, Caleb has set up a um, crowdfunding project which will uh, allow him and his brother and his sisters to um, get some, uh, accept some contributions to smooth the transition over. Um, we've been uh, in need of a new mobile friendly web store for uh, quite a few years and just haven't had the wherewithal uh, to bring that off. Uh, in addition, we have very um, erratic um, web service here, internet service here, and uh, we'd like to bring in some fiber optic line from a, a fairly nearby line from 3,200 feet away. Um, and these are things that would make us more uh, um, uh, stable and signal uh, both uh, uh, inbound and out and uh, uh, better for things like this webinar. So if you uh, uh, are able to check out that uh, crowdfunding, uh, and help us, every little bit helps, uh, even small donations do add up. And this is gonna be a quick uh, web, uh, excuse me, a quick crowdfunding um, campaign that's gonna end uh, uh, later this month. Um, uh, we need to have it complete before the seed shipping gets crazy here uh, once February starts up. Okay, so I see Frank has listed that uh, URL for the crowdfunding website. On uh, okay, and he says it's a hot one if I can do that. Okay, good. All right. So um, loose sands um, or finish. Last time around, uh, we were talking about the variety, and um, I guess I should have checked my notes because there were a couple of things I uh, meant to say and, and never got to. Uh, so I'll bring up my stories just, and let me use that also as a point that if you have any questions, feel free to ask them at any time uh, and uh, answer them, uh, whether they be on butte, whether they be on um, uh, potatoes or some other subject um, uh, having to do with organic, we're happy to try to uh, uh, answer it. So I guess, um, as we mentioned uh, last time around, butte um, was a variety bred by University of Idaho uh, by Dr. in 1965. Um, it was released in 1977. And when new varieties are released, um, there's quite a, an interest among seed growers uh, uh, across, especially the northern tier states where the uh, seed potato growers uh, uh, are located. So back when it was a brand new variety <laughs> in the late 70s, a friend of mine, um, brought in a tractor trail of uh, butte seed potatoes from Idaho, and that, that would be anywhere between 50,000 pounds of seed. And uh, he got half of that load, and uh, Maine Farmers Exchange, one of the uh, potato dealers up here, they got the other half. And in order to, to bring in any seed into a state like Maine from another state, it's required that the use uh, be accompanied by, by a phytosanitary certificate signed by the uh, Department of Ag authorities in Idaho tying freedom from um, certain uh, disease uh, and, and insect problems. So uh, my friend uh, brought this load in, had the phytosanitary, but lo and behold, uh, testing that summer determined that uh, on the uh, in the dirt on the skin of those seed potatoes coming in from Idaho uh, was a terrible pest called the Columbia root knot nematode. Maine is uh, free of, of Columbia root knot nematode found in the West. And in fact, uh, the state of Maine <clears throat> has a quarantine on most counties in the Western United States 
in an effort to prevent um, Columbia root knot nematode being brought into the state of Maine. Um, one of the uh, problems with Columbia root knot is that it's very winter hardy and uh, uh, other nematodes are not so winter hardy so our harsh winter conditions uh, can control Columbia root knot nematode is known to exist and thrive in areas that has uh, winter conditions as cold as they are in Maine. Obviously, the best way, the simplest way uh, to, pre, you know, to combat a problem is simply not to bring it in in the first place. So that's why the subpoena is in effect. My friend had every expectation of, of getting this new variety uh, where there was a lot of demand for it um, and getting kind of a jump on it and uh, had been um, assured by the authorities in Idaho that uh, feed was free of uh, the nematode. Uh, in the course of that summer, a friend's uh, certification was pulled from all of his acreage uh, by the state of Maine. Uh, they pulled and pulled the uh, acreage, kicked it out of the program, and over the next course of uh, a few years, my friend uh, uh, went belly up. You know, if you're a seed grower and you don't have any seed that's certifiable uh, for growing seeds, that's a, a definite marketing challenge. So um, he was be helped by USDA in Washington. They never came through, uh, and then he had a lot of trouble. So this butte, uh, as a result, picked on, picked up, um, you know, a bit of a uh, reputation, though it was not deserved. The fact is, the variety is good, and as we're going to get into later in this uh, webinar, as you will see, the tissue culture propagation. Um, procedure is such that it is impossible for um, nematodes to transfer through that process so that when you plant clean seed developed from tissue cultured seed it is going to be completely free of nematodes uh, and for that matter free of disease but you've got some traditional farmers that don't quite understand all of the ramifications of tissue culture so when a when a problem comes up with a variety, they may not have the real details um, on it, but they have in the back of their head, butte, there's a problem with it. So butte ended up being a little bit, you know, had a little bit of a drag on it because of that um, reputation, which was not undeserved. Um, we got into growing butte uh, back in the mid 80s, about 30 years ago. And as I said last week or last time, it is one of the best. Uh, varieties that we grow in terms of growing under organic conditions is very rugged, it's a very reliable uh, work. So it uh, became available widely in the late 70s, we started growing in the 80s. Here's what happened in the butte. About the midnight of McDonald's, which is uh, the world's number one purchase rise, uh, they uh, eat it that they would no longer buy french fries that were made from butte and here was the problem when butte would come out of long-term storage say in March, um, some of the um, would have through respiration converted to simple sugars which it up into french fries would have some brown coloration um, and McDonald's, for that matter, Frito-Lay and their, their chips, they really have this um, uh, uh, exceptional requirement for whiteness. They, they want white chips, white fries, they don't want any discoloration. Uh, so McDonald's at Butte uh, was not satisfactory out of long-term storage, and in the end they said we're not going to buy any French fries made from Butte. Well, that uh, uh, stand. Uh, basically becomes a death blow for any variety. So uh, beginning in the mid-90s, butte became a, a hard-to-come-by variety. Um, we uh, continued to grow it. Um, in some years, when I look at the national um, uh, seed entry listings, uh, uh, many, many are the years where we are the only certified seed grower in the United States growing this butte, and we'll continue to grow it. It's a great variety. Uh, we have a steady uh, source of tissue cultured seed, the main seed potato board, uh, and it's one that uh, 
Uh, it's one of our the most properties that we sell, sell uh, to our customers. So uh, we have a nice niche. Ute is just the, the victim of um, uh, kind of uh, a smear campaign that really uh, great variety. Uh, Joe Pavick did a great job in breeding it. Uh, it continues to be uh, a reliable variety year in, year out. It's very good under organic conditions. Um, but that's just um, uh, the potato industry can be somewhat fickle and um, uh, they can drop uh, potato uh, you know, pretty quickly. I'm not, not going to use the hot potato uh, example. So um, let that all out there that it's important um, as he, uh, um, it is possible to not only poorly performing seed, which nobody wants, but it's also possible to bring in your uh, farm or to your garden, like Columbia nematode or uh, um, bacterial ring rot, uh, uh, stubborn uh, uh, disease, uh, and, and bacteria are very difficult to control. Uh, seed potato growers. Um, go to a lot of effort to try to prevent the spread of uh, bacterial ring rot, uh, disinfecting seed knives, disinfecting um, uh, potato storages, pallet boxes, any um, uh, contact with potatoes. Uh, and those are good sanitary uh, procedures, and they're all aimed at bacteria. And bacterial ring rot um, is actually much less of a problem nowadays since tissue culture uh, came in than it used to be prior to tissue culture because also with tissue culture you do not have the spread of uh, uh, bacteria like bacterial ring rot. So um, what I'm advised that when you're selecting seed, um, especially of seed potatoes, you need to be careful uh, because what you could be bringing into your soil is something that will have long lasting uh, harm for you <clears throat> over many years. So. Um, when you're buying seed, you want to know who you're getting the seed from to make sure that uh, they have a quality operation and that in addition to bringing you good harvest, you're not bringing in something uh, unwanted that, that could hamper you over the long term. Okay, we're going to go to the next slide. Okay, so tissue culturing. Uh, I believe... I'm not certain of this, but I believe that tissue culturing goes back to the late 1940s. Um, state of Maine, we have a, um, a lab um, uh, basically owned by the industry, uh, used to be owned by the people of the state of Maine, but has since been transferred uh, from the people of the state of Maine over to the Maine Seed Potato Board, which is the industry uh, trade uh, group for uh, Maine, seed, Maine potato growers. Um, the process of tissue culturing is legitimate. It's specifically allowed under USDA National Organic Program um, uh, regulations, specifically allowed process, and it's a good one. I'm glad that we're able to use it. Uh, the fact is, uh, virtually all modern potatoes whether they be, an, or say in the case of rose fin apple, uh, which uh, we've been growing for many years and dates back to the 1840s, uh, pushing 200 years old, all modern day potatoes grown are the result of tissue culturing. And the benefit is this, as the sprout is growing on a cultured plant in these test tubes, say, um, you can, uh, every three weeks, you can take a cutting. Uh, as you see, those sprouts kind of look like an alfalfa sprout. Every, you can cut that sprout into five pieces. Uh, so start out with, say, one sprout. Three weeks later, you've got five pieces. Three weeks, 25 pieces. Three, three weeks after that, 125. After that, 625. So you can see that in a relative time, you can propagate it up vegetatively um, that is completely free of disease and pests. Interesting uh, um, fact about this is, you know, how, how does, when, when the 
the cells are dividing at the um, point of growth, they are growing faster than potato virus can grow. So, um, so long as you start with uh, the um, ability uh, plant in the test tube to grow will grow faster than the virus and you will get virus free. Now, getting to that point of having clean stock uh, can become a challenge. And when any new stock is, say, brought into the porter farm, they have a protocol to where they work on the assumption that it's contaminated. And they, there are procedures to go through, heat procedures, chemical procedures, and other cases to where they will clean this up. But the point is they have a laboratory filled with uh, sterile in sterile conditions with no disease, and they want to make sure that they don't certainly introduce something. So by using this protocol, working on the assumption coming in, uh, they will test for it, uh, clean it up as necessary to get off uh, starting on the right foot. So these cuttings, once you uh, multiply up to uh, the number that you need, then you go into the next stage. And that's where um, I transfer them over to a uh, growing medium. And this is uh, what things used to look like. These are um, uh, called pre-nuclear plants. They are potato plants that have been grown from the cuttings that you saw uh, in the test tubes. Um, and these were grown in uh, soilless media, um, usually a combination of uh, uh, perlite or vermiculite, um, uh, some other um, um, components. Uh, and this is how it used to be done up until about 10 years ago. This was how potatoes were produced. And in fact, um, here in Maine, um, due to the uh, work of um, uh, the plant manager at Porter Farm, uh, Dr. Uh, Vikram Bish, he actually, he and I put together uh, um, the details for the first uh, uh, tissue cultured uh, produced uh, mini tubers in the United States. Um, we uh, brought in uh, compost from Vermont from our friend Carl Hammer at Vermont Organic Compost, uh, who was a master compost maker. And uh, that was the media uh, that our organic uh, mini grown in. Um, what, one thing that I found quite interesting, we, we did this for uh, several years, and the plant organic media, uh, I was told, were always uh, and healthier looking than the plants grown uh, on ProMix in uh, conventional media. And, you know, as an organic farmer, that doesn't uh, surprise me in that, you know, there is a life force in uh, good common, the plants benefit from that. and and produce accordingly. So the way things used to be done, uh, if you look close, you can kind of see wooden boxes on the right side that these are growing in, and they would have mesh spores, and uh, they had they invented basically shake the, um, uh, well, uh, prior to harvest, they would either use fungicides to kill the plants down, or in the case of the organic, organically produced ones, they simply turned off the water uh, because this is an artificial growth situation and you needed water to um, live during the plants would die and, and that would do it rather than have to spray herbicides. Um, uh, container filled with uh, uh, soilless media and what are called mini tubers and then they had an invention that would shake the dirt through and collect the mini tubers off and it was a, it's a slick machine. So any tubers that come out from that are called PN or pre-nuclear. Uh, they range in size anywhere from um, the size of an eraser on a pencil pad uh, up to maybe quarter size. And um, our preference for size is to get tubers that are uh, between dime diameter and nickel diameter. Um, the smaller the tuber, the longer they take to emerge and under organic conditions, that length can let the weeds get going. And uh, we think that a good compromise uh, in terms of you know, getting 30 mini tubers per pound 
and many Ubers are from thirty dollars to forty dollars a pound. So you're talking a dollar to a dollar and a quarter a piece there at Santa Cruz. Um, in any case, we like the moderate sized tubers. I do know some growers that have access to herbicides. They like to save money and they plant all uh, tubers in an effort to get more per pound. But um, as in many things with organic, going a moderate course is the preferential course. So we like to get um, both value for our money and also uh, fast emergence and strong early growth that can help uh, outcompete uh, things like uh, weeds that are coming on. So, um, in more recent years, a new technique has come along, which in some places um, has replaced uh, growth in uh, soilless media, and that's called NFP, and that stand, stands for nu Nutrient Film. And this is basically, I would say, I would call it something like a, a hybrid hydroponics. Um, uh, 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 the state of Maine um, at the Porter Farm, uh, I think it was a half million dollar project. And the way it works is you've got plants growing and they're constantly misted. Um, uh, the roots are constantly misted with a um, um, solution that, you know, a, a synthetic feed solution that pretty much the, the needs of the plants. And these tubers. Uh, mini tubers are grown and you can go in and you can pluck the tubers off on a weekly basis, a bi-weekly basis, once they reach the size that you want. So what they like about this is the yields are quite a bit higher than they were getting on the batch style growth of uh, the soilless media. Uh, and it's kind of like that. If you grow a hill of potatoes uh, and you can dig into the hill and you pluck out individual tubers that have reached the size that you want, you're going to be um, getting a bigger yield than if you simply grow the plant, kill it at a certain time, harvest the whole thing. If you do it that way, you're going to get some large tubers, some medium, and some small. If you um, pull out the large tubers, allow the small and mediums to size up, it makes logical sense that you're going to get a higher yield. And that, in fact, is what NFP is, is all about. And even though the system is 10 years old, it still is uh, uh, not widely developed and there's a lot of secrecy going on. Uh, um, I think many places still do not permit cameras to be taken in uh, because there's uh, information and technique that is considered proprietary. Um, but as a result, um, the uh, Porter Farm, where we get our, our uh, from, uh, they no longer are doing uh, growth in the soilless media. Uh, so we are getting uh, the mini tubers produced under the NFP system. And, uh, um, you know, that's just uh, uh, the way things sometimes go. If, if I were asked, I, I would still like to uh, get them grown in soilless media. I had confidence that those produced in, in Carl Hammer's uh, uh, compost mix were high quality and uh, worth the extra effort and maybe the extra expense in it. But um, anyway, those are days gone by and, and times have changed and that's no longer an option. So um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, type them in on the, uh, on the chat. Uh, and I'll keep going uh, talking about uh, mini tubers in multiple time. So once we <clears throat> bring home mini tubers, and <clears throat> every year we um, purchase approximately 200 pounds of mini tubers, uh, we plant those uh, uh, in the best part of the field, uh, wanting them to do best. Uh, we do warm them up a little bit in kind of a mini green sprouting procedure, uh, but it's trickier with uh, mini tubers because you've got such a small tube of uh, skin surface area and it takes extra care to be able to uh, prevent them from getting um, uh, uh, having moisture loss that that is significant so what we've learned is that we basically warm the seed up maybe for a week or 10 days before we plant and and these uh, mini tubers are the first thing we plant 
um, when it comes to potatoes. Uh, after the grain is in, the very next crop we'll plant is mini tubers. Uh, our desire is to get them to grow <clears throat> as quickly as they can uh, to prevent um, things like aphids from coming in that might um, have blown in here on the winds and brought in a virus with them and hence for um, virus from a uh, either from a sick plant plant or there are some uh, some forms of potato virus uh, I think it's called circulatory to where it's right in that aviatory system to where as soon as they blow onto a potato field then, um, they stick their probe in uh, within one second they can transfer that virus into the potato plant so um, as the season goes more likelihood of aphid later on in the season so the, the earlier you can plant the more quickly you can grow your crop the less of it you have which might expose you to uh, potato virus contamination by aphids so um, so we plant the mini tubers uh, as early as we can uh, they're the first thing that we kill uh, again trying to minimize the uh, potential for um, spread uh, of disease by aphids they're the first thing that we harvest. Um, we plant our mini tubers about nine inches apart in row. We experiment. We've gone back and forth between planting them on beds, uh, nine inches each way. Uh, um, that's a more intensive way of doing it. Um, uh, I guess I'm still undecided. Uh, last last two years, we've gone back to um, picking the fertile corners of the field, high ground, and uh, planting the mini tubers there and we're getting good production so I think we may um, stick with that but we have experimented in the bed system uh, much the same way that you might in, in an intensive bed so uh, the mini tubers that are in the spring those are called uh, pre nuclear PN there's, uh, there's a new terminology that is being adapted um, by the uh, seed potato industry History. Um, not a fan of the new terminology. I, I think the old terminology is superior, um, but be that as it may, uh, it used to be uh, when you planted mini tubers, PN, you would harvest N1 or nuclear 1 in the fall. And this has nothing to do with power or nuclear energy. It, what it has to do with is as in the nuclear family. And, and as you remember, all potatoes are vegetatively propagated. Uh, so, um, as they um, they are um, effectively uh, closely related, uh, vegetatively propagated, uh, and it's a system whereby well over ten percent of all potatoes are uh, raised this way. We got a call yesterday from for true potato seed. Would, is a tiny, tiny seed variety that we played with 20 or 30 years, years ago was called Catalina. And um, uh, it seems like forever um, people, entrepreneurs, have been trying to invent true potato seed that would allow them to replace this uh, crop excess that has been in place for over 100 years, and that's propagating by certified seed tubers. Um, Invariably, you know, those are uh, these nightshades were, uh, you know, basically equatorial plants in a very long season. They grow very slow, a lot slow to grow. Uh, and, you know, so far, um, my limited experience with it, it seems like um, the, the multiplication and propagation system that's been in place for a hundred years is still going strong. Um, and that doesn't look like it's going to be replaced by a true seed anytime soon. We plant mini tubers in the, um, in the spring, nuclear one. Uh, what we harvest, excuse me, let me back up, that's not correct. We plant PN, pre nuclear, in the spring, and what we harvest that fall, that generation is called one or nuclear one. Okay, uh, uh, maybe I'm not coming through. Uh, loud and clear, so I'll uh, I'll speak up. Can you lower that microphone down, maybe? 
All right, making a little technical adjustment. If anyone else is having trouble, um, uh, can you please let me know and, and we'll make an adjustment. Uh, oh, okay, Teresa's saying much better. Okay, thanks, Teresa, I appreciate that. Okay, so what we have harvested that, that first year used to be called nuclear one. And <clears throat> on our farm and on those seed farms, we would take the entire harvest of nuclear one, and that's what we would plant the next spring, and what we would harvest that, that second fall, that would be nuclear two. Um, that's where things start to change. If it's a um, early or mid-season variety, we would likely take the nuclear two and replant the entirety of that, or harvest nuclear three, and start to sell nuclear three or more. If it's a late variety, um, especially a variety like peanut that is very um, troublesome in picking up um, um, uh, potato virus Y. Uh, we often would grow that in the second generation and just start over that one. There's, there's a quirk about every variety, and my belief is if you can't find two serious drawbacks with every variety, you're not variety hard enough. So in the case of peanut, uh, it's a great variety, very reliable, very uniform, but it is a tough one to grow uh, organically in terms of keeping the seed clean. It has a real tendency of picking up uh, PDY. And another fingerling variety that we grew uh, back 20 years ago, gave up growing it in the uh, summer of 95, which I remember clearly it was a, uh, the year, uh, it was a drought year, and I can remember where those uh, peanuts were um, excuse me, those osettes were growing on the uh, on the home farm. Uh, and we uh, ended up uh, having to kill them down. We, we pulled them out of uh, our seed inspector, <laughs> helped us make up our mind. Um, we got virus in them, and we had, uh, uh, had continuing problems with that variety of, of picking up virus and clean, clean seed. And in fact, uh, the crop of 94, on the day that we um, killed the Ozette, we, uh, we took leave and had them tested, and they were free of disease, and then we killed them. I went back and forth with that flamer and burned, them, burned the tops down to smithereens to where there was absolutely nothing green on top of the ground that an aphid could have possibly transferred. So then 95, the next year, we planted that. Those at we had, I think, uh, probably 600 foot long. And on first inspection, we had over 5% virus. And um, it basically, I talked it over with my seed inspector, talked it over with some of the uh, potato scientists that we have here in Maine. And it just seemed like Ozette was a variety that doesn't like to play with anyone else. Um, you know, the Ozette Indians grew this as an interesting story to that variety, but. Um, um, in extreme northwestern Washington state, uh, the Ozette Indians, they don't even have a word in their vocabulary for vegetable. This was the only thing that they grew. And apparently it was brought up by Spanish conquistadors back in the 1600s or something, working their way up. And, uh, you know, maybe they brought up dozens of varieties, but the Ozette was the only one that did well in uh, temperate rainforest climate of the whole river, uh, which is part of Olympic National Park if you've never been out that way. And I, I have, and I've never seen the green in my life. But those are very tough conditions. I think, if I recall, I think they get 150 inches of precipitation, which would be on average half of half of an inch of rain a day. And I don't know there uh, because it's on the Pacific Ocean, lower elevation inland you know, 50 miles away in the Olympic Mountains, you've got elevation, they get snow, but tall coming as rain. So uh, imagine trying to grow a variety in, in that probably fog in the summer, lots of rain in the winter. It would be tough, but that lasted for that long, and it was the only variety, as I understand it, the only well, its tendency towards getting PPY. It's not a problem if you've got a variety that is acclimated, say it's got have a lot of Y in it, it's still pretty year after year, and you've got no, no other varieties either to double up virus onto Ozette or for Ozette to um, contaminate. In our case, 
because we grow 20 different varieties of seed potatoes, if we grow ozet, ozet in the middle and, and right where those ozets were growing that year in 95, they were right smack dab in the middle of our potato patch on the home farm. It becomes basically like having hypoid mary. It becomes an inoculum source for every other variety on that farm. And um, so that was the last year we grew it. Uh, we decided after first inspection and in mid uh, to kill uh, kill them. We uh, went over with the roto beater and we went over uh, and blistered them out to where there would be any inoculum to spread by um, aphids. And that was the last time we grew Ozette. And I know when there's uh, slow food has de designated it as one of their special varieties. And, um, um, you know, we, we liked it. It's a good idea. It's a pretty variety to look at, but uh, it just didn't seem to be one that uh, fit our system, so we dropped that. Um, so that was a tangent I got off. Um, uh, the point is when you're in with a clean seed, as generations go by, they tend to pick up some kind of disease. Potato virus is usually a debilitating disease that uh, potato farmers don't like because it can, within as little as one generation, result in a significant decline in yield. And that's really where the potato certification program uh, came into play a um, hundred years ago. Uh, back then, didn't quite know what was going on, but they had developed a term called running out, that a seed lot would run out and it would not um, perform well. And the seed itself uh, could very well look just like any other uh, tuber, you know, with no deformities in it, but it would not produce. And um, we had one customer call us 15 or 20 years ago and, and was asking us, uh, they'd been saving their seed uh, for many years and that last year they, they planted 100 pound, come fall they harvested 100 pound. So they basically got their seed back. And, uh, you know, um, what became apparent to us was that over the years had loaded up so heavily with virus that it was basic under uh, a productive variety. If you can only get back uh, the seed that you just well go fishing and not bother to grow anything that summer. So uh, the way around that is to grow in isolation and to uh, start out with good seed that is the result of tissue culture propagation that is going to be disease free. So. As I said, in recent years, attempt, I mean, there's been an attempt for 20 or 30 years to try to get uniform uh, nomenclature among the field generations. Now, anything grown in the field, the first year it's grown in the field and harvested, it's called E1, field grown one. Second year, FD2 and on. And that logically makes sense. However, um, from my perspective as a Mainer, there are four states that have university run seed propagation facilities. Maine, New York, Montana, and who's the fifth one? Well, there's, no, there's a fourth one, there's four of us. And all of us, um, the university run programs, I believe, uh, have higher quality uh, tubers coming from their tissue culture labs for this, um, for this reason. They do testing. Um, in, in the state of Maine, standard protocol is they take leaf from every single plant in, in the tissue culture process at the early stage, and they lab test that for freedom from disease. Um, University labs, they have the personnel, they have the capability, they can do that testing internally. If you have to go to Agdia uh, in Indiana, to, uh, they got to make a living and they charge handsomely for the uh, testing that they do. If you don't have that internal test ability, it becomes very costly. So um, Arthur is asking how complicated is tissue culture? Any hope for a farmer to do it on his own? Interesting you should ask, Arthur. I believe that a farmer could do tissue culture propagation on his own, and this is one of the things that I um, am looking into. However, I, 
I think you're going to end up with this problem of doing the testing and uh, having the, the testing procedure and the, the uh, material that you use as a control to make sure that testing, you know, that you have a, a correct positive, you don't get the, that works if you're doing some volume of testing, but if you're doing a small amount, I think the testing is going to be a problem. And this is something I want to do more into. I know um, uh, Seed Savers Exchange had a um, uh, kerfuffle, oh, maybe 10, 10 years ago, and um, you had uh, Will Bonsall, uh, my friend here, who had 150 or 200 varieties of potato in the collection uh, uh, that he would grow every year for Seed Savers Exchange. And you had another fellow, I think he was in Michigan, and he would grow 150 or 200 varieties, different varieties. And they decided that uh, it was kind of risky to have these varieties simply grown in a single location. They did what makes kind of common sense, uh, you know, uh, done to them. Uh, and they traded in something like half of their, uh, their, they swapped. So half of the Michigan collection came to Will and half of Will's collection went to the farm in uh, Michigan out. And it was an absolute disaster. Within one generation, you had um, a doubling up of virus. Uh, I think each collection had their own kind of endemic uh, uh, virus, which was acceptable under their own isolation, kind of like the Ozette Indians in the variety Ozette. But when they swapped it back and forth, you had this doubling up, uh, maybe even tripling up of virus. And within one generation, um, Will was telling me, you had, a, a, say, a variety that should have been a baker, 12 ounces. They were the size of a peanut. Within one generation, you got this uh, uh, bogging down. So um, it was a uh, understandable uh, mistake, which um, uh, fortunately they were able to uh, get around. Um, SDA had a uh, potato propagation facility in Sturgeon Bay. It's, oh, that's Wisconsin. Sorry. My story, when I've been referring to Michigan, I think I meant Wisconsin. Um, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, right? Is it Wisconsin or is it Maine? Michigan. I think it's, I think it was. Anyway. They, uh, they had some extra microscopes and some extra stuff for tissue culturing, and they gave the seed saver uh, in Michigan or Wisconsin. Um, some of the converted to closet. It is Wisconsin. Okay. So all my, all my references to Michigan, but I really meant to say was Wisconsin. So this is uh, a tissue culture lab in a closet in his home and, um, uh, and was successful, and they... They did a good job. I mean, this is what USDA ought to be doing, uh, but they helped this guy. They gave him training. They held his hands, able to uh, burn out some of the virus within that collection and save these varieties uh, that otherwise would have been lost. Um, but truth in that, and that you do have to be careful um, uh, when it comes to vegetatively propagated plants. Um, you have to be careful about bringing in something that could impact what you're growing. So um, uh, be that a word to the wise. So uh, Arthur, in answer, uh, I think it is possible, but I do think the big challenge is testing. And maybe there's going to be some breakthrough to where this testing can become less expensive. But what you don't want to do is tissue culture and then multiplying up plants that have disease in them, unbeaten, you know, in that way, you're not going to be any ahead than if you didn't go through tissue culture. So um, I can keep rambling on, but uh, I would like to reserve time for answering questions. So um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please um, uh, type them in and, and I'll pick them up. And until I see a question, I'll just keep rambling on here. So um, in Maine, uh, we have a washout system. In fact, I think I think by now, I think Maine had the first washout system that I believe came in almost 30 years ago. And what that means is they count the number of generations uh, and that potatoes were grown in the field. And there's a washout that you grow um, uh, potatoes out in the state of Maine 
for more than, I think now it's probably up to about uh, five, maybe six, six generations right now. And I think they're going to trim that back to five generations uh, in another year. Um, and it, it's actually a, a good idea because the more years the plants are in the soil, the more virus they pick up. You know, a seed grower, uh, um, uh, the joke is uh, if a seed grower really wanted to do a good job, he would give his neighbors who were process and table sock growers, he'd give them their seed because it's the process and table sock guys that introduce the inoculum into the neighborhood that then affects uh, the seed growers. So having isolation is a real advantage when you're a seed grower. Uh, if you don't have the inoculum, you know, there's this three-legged stool for um, conditions of disease. You've got to have um, a host, you've got to have the environmental uh, conditions, and you've got to have um, host environmental condition for them. So if you have no inoculum, if, if you are isolated and don't have uh, neighbors that would have potatoes with virus, in and of itself, theoretically could prevent you from much of a problem with virus, but you do have some aphids that blow in that have virus. Uh, if you're growing potatoes, you've got the host. Uh, and this, this pertains to um, uh, foliar diseases like uh, uh, potato late blight. Um, you could have wet conditions like the Irish countryside. Uh, uh, you could have a field of potatoes, you've got the host, but if you've got no inoculum, you have a disease condition. However, if the inoculum is present in the nation with the environmental conditions of cool, moist wet, below 80 degrees, say mid 60s to uh, high 70s, um, that potato late flight likes. And if you got the inoculum and you got a wet year, you potentially have a problem that you have to deal with. Um, if you have isolation, if you don't have inoculum for whatever reason, then regardless of whether the conditions are uh, apt for um, in this case, late flight, you will not have it unless you have that inoculum. So the three stool, the three legs of that stool have to be met in order to have this condition. But the same way with, with virus, though it is a little complicated because it's not simply aphids transferring, but there are some viruses that the aphids can have some, so they blow onto the field and you can get uh, transmission uh, without ever having having had one sick plant in your own field. So the new system, uh, FG1, FG2, 3, FG4, and on up to five and six, that does not recognize what is a biased Maine uh, seed grower feels is a superior system that we have in Maine. And it was the only, um, only those four states that had university run propagation facilities that where they had the inherent testing, those were the only ones that could use nuclear one, two, three, and four. If you added nuclear four in the soil in the spring, what you would harvest in the uh, fall, that would be G1, generation one. So um, that, oh, 20 years ago, we'd have four generations of nuclear N1 through N4, have four generations of G, G1 through G4. So that would be eight year in the soil. And I know it is confusing to people, um, but it's particularly confusing to people outside of those four states that have a um, production superiority. And it was there, you know, that's where politics, I believe, in my opinion, came into play. I think the majority of states didn't have these university systems. They didn't have the new, and it was to their advantage to uh, homogenize the um, lexicon to where it appears that they're all the same. And I felt that Maine system was a superior system. And, you know, uh, as a Maine seed grower, I wish that we had had it. But that was the old days, and we no longer uh, um, have that. So we're into the feet FG system. Uh, you covers in the spring as we do. And then in the fall, we are harvesting FG1. And what we are selling to folks like you when we ship out in the springtime, say, that would typically be know, uh, FG3 or something like that. Uh, every year we renew mini tubers so that we're always starting uh, fresh. So you 
take any given variety, gold frosts, to have three generations of any given variety. The mini tubers, the PM that we planted, uh, clear one. I'm still used to calling it nuclear one, and I guess uh, my webinar, I'm going to still call it nuclear one. So we'd have N1 and N2, and then we'd be selling off uh, for N3. Um, so in our case, we've got 20, 20. This is why we have 60, 65 different seed lots every year, 20 different varieties, average of three generations per variety of 60 seed lots. So it can get uh, a little bit confusing. Um, but we've got a pallet box uh, harvest uh, production system now. So we harvest every seed lot goes into its own pallet box. Every pallet three by five card with a, a number from one to 120, 119 uh, pallet boxes that we can put away. Uh, and these are 2,000 pound uh, pallet boxes. Not every box is full, but every box has its own unique identity and then uh, also stapled to the box is uh, a color-coded card that has the variety and the seed lot source and the seed lot generation so we can know exactly what variety, what generation, how many years it's been in the soil. And then when we get the Florida readings come back in uh, later this month in January, we can decide what seed lots um, uh, are best for us to, and uh, what ones are better for us customer might grow it for one generation and then plant it out. And uh, the ideal is to grow uh, as a seed grower nothing over half a percent virus. Uh, and we do a uh, tuber unit plant, which is a topic for another day. Okay? Um, but uh, to rogue out uh, the plants that are off type contain virus. Um, so we've got us left on this um, webinar. Uh, if anyone has a question, I'll answer it. Um, in the meantime, I can just keep talking. Uh, let's see. One of the things that I would um, say is that um, the materials that used to be used, everyone now uh, with the bees and all has heard of neonicotinoids. Uh, the material that's been used common on potato farms um, is a, a neonic uh, called Admire, uh, made by Bayer. It was introduced in the mid 1990s and it, it is applied in furrow, a systemic applicator, uh, which is a um, that peters into the soil anywhere from 2 to 30 pounds worth of material, a tiny amounts in furrow. And this um, uh, this is typically uh, with the product in, in admire. They, it's a systemic pesticide, and that would provide protection for conventional potatoes up until um, up until uh, about the first week in August. So if an aphid were to come in. Uh, it would kill that a paradigm shift need there is that you know it takes uh, sometimes uh, a few seconds to kill that aphid but they can transmit in one second so they're not going to transmit anymore but they could transmit that one thing but once they admire peters out and now because of the 20 years use of this um, insects are developing resistance and admire is starting to fail in different cases and uh, um, other insecticides are now used, but this is one reason seed growers like to plant early, kill early in case there's a late um, uh, flight of aphids uh, to minimize aphid spread to try to get that crop in and out with minimal uh, impact. Okay, here Arthur's got a question. Uh, and the question is, how many years might I get out of planting? Oops, two questions. Suzanne, let me get hers first. Uh, what are the virus problems for the indigenous tubers in the Andes? Um, interesting thing, they're growing at elevations uh, sometimes 14, 15,000 feet up to, I think, 6,000 feet. At least 30 years ago when Wendell Berry got this, uh, now with climate change that may have shifted, it may be, and I don't know, can they go any higher than 16,500 feet to try to get the uh, temperature conditions that they've had for thousands of years at those various elevations? But as I understand it, those high elevations, um, there is no aphids uh, 
um, at those elevations, and I bet um, any late light spores would be burned up radi radiation at that. So if you're either in the Andes or Pos isolated Rocky Mountain Valley, where you've got you know 14,000 foot peaks around, that the wind and blowing those spores up that high, I believe that the UV radiation burns them up and prevents at least late light from coming in. And I, I believe that they don't have aphids because of that elevation. I believe there's some correlation. I haven't read that for 20 or 30 years, so I, I don't remember exactly why, but I believe it's the elevation giving them a, a benefit. Okay, and now first question. Uh, how many years might I get out of planting of your seed potatoes? And, and two, uh, do I need to buy every year, and is there a testing in Pennsylvania that would help me decide? Well, um, we have many customers that buy from us every year. I think that that works if you're in a north. Uh, the further south you are, the more likely <coughs> rays have been uh, uh, if affected by. And, and I'll tell you this, um, professionals, be they organic or be they uh, conventional, they buy certified seed every year. And the reason is this, highest level of assurance that they're going to get a good crop. Now, they might get a good crop from their own seed, but then they might not. And if you've got other factors like physiological aging of seed in the northern tier states, uh, from Maine across to uh, Washington, uh, Maine and Mont, in my opinion, probably have the best seed in the United States. Uh, you've also got good seed production going on in North Dakota, um, also in Wisconsin, Michigan, and New York. All northern tier states, cool summers, less activity, less physiological aging. You take two tubers, one growing in a hot climate, one in a cool climate, the harvest coming from that hot climate will be older, it will have less energy in it for the next generation. Physiological age is a, a function of vigor. So now what I do is experiment. Uh, I'd get some seed from us this year and maybe take some of your seed and grow them side by side um, uh, with no other modifications. Same soil, same fertilizer, plant them on the same day, tend them the same way so that the only variation is the seed source and then see for yourself. I think if you're a northern grower, you can probably get away planting a seed every other year. Um, for a southern grower, um, a lot of people, a growing number of people are planting seed in fall. And the problem is they need to plant when we uh, have not yet harvested. What I tell them they might do is buy seed from us for their harvest that crop at the normal time, May or June, and take a portion uh, that, they, that they're going to need for planting in, say, August or September, stick it in the back of their walk-in cooler or the back of their refrigerator weeks before their planting date in the fall, remove them from the uh, refrigeration, allow them that they will have gone through their dormancy, that will allow them to break out of dormancy and they'll be uh, ready to grow. Um, and then they come back and buy new seed from us every year. So even a southern grower then can get two from one seed lot bought from us or uh, another northern grower. So experiment. Uh, the further north you are, the more practical it is to uh, save your own seed. The further s south you are, uh, the more you uh, probably want to buy seed from a northern grower every year. And in terms of testing done in PA, you know, there may be. I, I, I know Agdia, A-G-I-A, has been around a long time. I believe they're in Indiana. Um, they, uh, from what I know, they do good work, but they are expensive, um, and uh, that would be the alternative that I know of. There could be others that can do that kind of testing. Uh, I just don't have that knowledge. You know, go to Penn State and see uh, uh, what your book is say. They should be plugged into that and, and uh, uh, um, you know, find out from them. I, I just don't have that knowledge. Okay, uh, Suzanne is asking, what are the health risks of eating potatoes with systemic such as admire? Well, uh, we eat organic potatoes. Uh, you know, uh, this this becomes this becomes a 
philosophical question. You're going to get studies in both directions. So I think at some point you got to kind of use um, uh, your own common sense. Here's what I think about, about systemics. Systemics like insecticides or fungicides. These were invented only for ornamental plants. They were never invented for food crops. The way systemics work, like you're putting that admirer in the furrow with the uh, it gets into the seed piece, then it acts. The reason it's called systemically, it acts systemically and it translocates to every plant. Well, the reason they call those tubers is because it's an extension of the stem. You've got a plant, you've got a stem, got, um, a swelling of the stem that becomes a tuber. If a systemic insecticide is translocating to every part of the plant, why in the world would it not be translocating uh, into the tuber? Now, uh, we know that uh, we have a, a dysfunctional regulatory system when they look at these um, uh, synthetic uh, inputs like like a, uh, an insecticide. Uh, the government doesn't do any testing. They rely upon the testing done by the manufacturer. So there's immediately a financial conflict of interest and then looking at uh, the interaction between multiple chemicals. They're looking at one chemical. Well, what if you've got two or three chemicals that are on that uh, tuber that you're going to make? What's the interaction? I don't think they know. Uh, so for certified organic growers, we think that's a smart way. If you, if you buy it to the plant, to the field, you're not going to have it in the tuber. And that's the safe way. If you can grow plants and food crops healthy, without the use of synthetic poisons. Seems to me uh, society is better off, people and families are better off, the environment is better off. But obviously it's uh, it's open to uh, great debate, but you know, I put my uh, vote on organic. Okay, um, Arthur uh, has a comment. I remember well the systemic disaster with Chemic on Long Island. What is your take on the International Potato Center in Peru? Um, well, that's two different questions. Uh, Chemic uh, was banned. Uh, it was a systemic insecticide. That stuff was so potent. I had friends that stopped using it even when it was legal to use it because it was so incredibly poisonous. Um, pure Chemic, two drops of pure Chemic on your skin would instantly kill a human being. It's that toxic. Uh, it was a systemic uh, insecticide used back in the, must have been banned in the 90s. What they found was that in sandy soils like we have here in Aroostook County, in Long Island, and in Florida, you would get this transference, a horizontal transference that could go remarkable distances, hundreds of feet. Like if you applied it here, you might ha you know, you have, a, say, a school next door with a, a well, you might see that chemical traveling, you know, a couple of hundred feet sideways and getting in that, that water. Um, and on our road, um, we had a, a house, a little house, and there was a, a well and there was a potato field right next to it. And the house was downhill and they had Temec in their well. Um, so I, I think it was good to have banned it. Um, and uh, it was particularly bad in sandy soil that was cold. So that's, they grow potatoes in Florida in the winter, so the soil was cold. In the summer in Long Island and Maine uh, in the north, you know, our soil is relatively cold, so that was a problem. So they did ban that. You know, the International Potato Center in Peru, I don't really know that much about it. Um, I believe that they're a good outfit and um, good work. Um, I would think that it must be very difficult to finance a program like that. I imagine that they have needs way, way beyond what their um, uh, capacity is to run. But I, I really don't have any inside knowledge uh, about them. But um, you know, Peru, the Andes, is where these um, uh, potatoes. That's the homeland. This is going back at least eight thousand years, uh, and uh, we, you know, we ought to respect contribution that they've had to the, the the world. You know, potatoes are something like the fourth biggest uh, food crop grown in the world today, and that all they all should go back to the Andeans in, in Bolivia. Bolivia and Ecuador and, and Peru. Those people for hundreds of generations that developed this um, uh, 
wonderful food. And really, you look at it, I don't know that they've ever received uh, any real compensation for having gifted the rest of the world. And I know there was um, Lisa Hamilton wrote a recent article, which we put on Facebook, talking about quinoa, which is, um, again, from the same um, uh, area in the, uh, in the Andes. And there, it being pirated and them being left in the dust and blame them for that concern. Uh, if you look back and use potatoes as an example, uh, they, they seem to have gifted it to the world without having really gotten anything back in exchange except uh, uh, competition, you know, from uh, capital intensive agriculture. Okay, and then uh, Arthur's, uh, uh, oh, okay, it's the same question about the International Data Center in Peru. So I see we're, uh, we're over two o'clock. Um, if anybody has some last questions, I'm uh, happy to bring it up. While I'm thinking on, Get my calendar. We have another webinar scheduled um, two weeks, exactly two weeks from today. It's going to be on Thursday, February, or, uh, January, Thursday, 21st at, at 1 p.m. Eastern, which is 10 a.m. Um, Pacific. And uh, we will send you out, um, everybody that's attending this webinar, we'll uh, send you an email that um, gives you the link to uh, registering for that webinar. And this um, webinar that we've had today, we'll turn this into a YouTube video. And in the same email, we will send you the, the link to that. So if you want to uh, uh, watch it again, or if you want to um, uh, uh, share it with friends, you'll be able to do so. Let me turn the slide. Just, uh, there's some contact information for us. Um, uh, Teresa's got a, a question. Uh, yes, this will be recorded, Teresa, and uh, we'll provide the link. Okay, and, and our uh, audio uh, broke up a little bit after we fixed it. How is it doing right now? Uh, let, let me know if it's going good. I'm not quite sure what the problem is, but uh, we'll try to come up with a solution for the next webinar. Okay, if any, okay, thank you, Suzanne. Suzanne says that I'm coming. It could be that maybe we need a little bit higher quality. Uh, uh, but uh, thanks for letting us know. There's no way we're going to know that we're not coming through loud and clear unless you tell us. Um, anybody else? Uh, um, thank you, Jan. Uh, uh, thanks for your compliment. Anybody else with any question, I'm happy to answer before we um, let you go. Well, I'm, I'm going to look at my notes this time and see what I've forgotten. Not seeing anything here. Frank says some folks are typing things, so we'll wait for another minute or two. So again, the date for the next webinar will be two weeks from today, same time, same place, day, January 21st, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific. And uh, we will send out an email that has the uh, link to register for that uh, webinar and also the link for the YouTube video of what we're uh, now concluding. And Teresha uh, says that she'll be anxious to this again to fill in what I missed with not being able to understand. Well, I hope the audio comes through on the YouTube. Um, and uh, everybody, um, in case you is a long time customer of ours, uh, she has a, a wonderful blog called Tending My Garden. And after time, first webinar, um, I think she said she listened to the um, uh, webinar five times and she uh, wrote down the, the different steps for green sprouting and uh, she got it right. She did a good job and uh, we shared that uh, link on the email, the seed pea letter that we sent out.
<clears throat> late morning today. So you can um, uh, find it there or, or you can go to uh, Teresa's uh, blog, Tending My Garden. It's an organic gardening blog and she does a great job with it. Uh, um, so thank, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, you've got contact information there and us again. And uh, this is the second in a series of uh, webinars that we'll be having this winter. Uh, next one will be two weeks from today. So we'll be signing off uh, and talk to you soon. Stay warm.